Well, they run into sort of an existential problem where the, you know, uh, the debt, um, the federal debt uh, uh, cost, the uh, interest, it, it just becomes unmanageable. I think it'd be probably borderline there. Um, so they'll, they'll have to do something to try and bring it down. And um, But I don't know. I mean, if it, I think the end game here, unless there's some sort of change in Congress, is the Fed, I think, is going to, I hate to see this because it's leading to the thing that I started this account to try and warn about, but the, the, I, I hope not, but I think the Fed might end up just buying everything, just, you know, in the name of, uh, you know, we don't want the, uh, the stock market to crash. Welcome back to Metals and Miners. I'm its founder and its host, Gary Bohm. Today we have an awesome discussion lined up, and we're fortunate to have with us Rudy Havenstein. Rudy, a former Reichsbank president and current senior market commentator, has created a satirical Twitter X account to shed light on the parallels between the financial crisis of his time and the challenges that we face today. Inspired by the recurring themes of inflation and the dangers of fiat money, Rudy uses humor and historical context to educate his audience about the complexities of the modern financial world. You can find all of his musings at A Havenstein Moment, which is his substack. This is where he shares all of his markets and geopolitical analysis. Rudy, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So let's begin our discussion with the Federal Reserve FOMC member, Neil Kashkari recently stated that the neutral rate or the natural rate of interest is likely higher now than where it was pre-pandemic. And as the U.S. debt continues to increase, then the neutral rate will also increase. With this being the case, what can we expect in terms of borrowing rates and their impact for the next few years? Well, I don't think Neil Kashkari has any more idea than you and I of what the, quote, natural rate is or R star, these other terms. We we tend to treat guys like him and others on the FOMC and other economists, you know, like Krugman's and stuff, as if they are a – it's not a hard science. I mean, they might as well be psychics. They have no idea. And the thing I've said for years about the, the natural rate, I know what Kashkari is saying. He's saying the more – basically the more debt we have, the more – the more we're going to have to entice people to buy it, right? So, but uh, how do you know what the natural rate is when the Fed still owns seven trillion or so of uh, of MBS and Treasuries? You know, sell those and we'll find out the natural rate. You know, I mean, so the whole thing is kind of just, you know, they they have physics envy and they try and they talk as if they know what they're talking about. But yeah, I mean, that's basically it. I mean, I you know at five percent recently, you know, on a T bill after you know, 15 years off and on of ZERP, um, to be able to get 5%, I, 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 I said, that sounds good. You know, you can buy T-bills, I think, in increments of $100 an hour. Uh, so I bought some, and um, uh, why not? But, you know, they're going to issue more debt. You know, do you want to – I think I've, I made a comment that I'd rather own Dogecoin than, than bonds, you know, than, uh, you know, for the long term. I mean, of course – you know, I'm, I know I'm not a bond guy, but uh, I, I'm sure there's real smart guys like, you know, uh, Harley Bassman or something who can do a trade, you know, and that there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, anything's good for a trade. But as far as long term bonds, um, I have no interest in them. I, I've never really had an interest in bonds, even though I missed out on this you know, historic rally over the last 40 years in that. But I did OK. Um, anyway, that's yeah, I, I don't I think that's in a nutshell what he's saying is. The more supply we provide, you know, the more we're going to have to entice to to induce demand, unless the Fed prints everything, you know, because uh, buys everything. Because every day uh, there's a great site called Financial Juice um, on Twitter that I I will retweet whatever the Fed bought that day, you know. And of course, they this is during the period of you know of QT, and they're buying, you know, four, five, six, eight, ten billion dollars of bonds almost every day. So. Um, Anyway, that's that's my thoughts on the So the you real men- rate. you mentioned, you know, let's find out if they were to sell their seven trillion dollars of mortgage backed securities and other and others. Well that's that- with treasuries. There's like two point four now, I think, trillion of MBS. They owned zero in two thousand eight. Right. So what happens if they did that? Oh, I would assume rates would spike. I mean, you're dumping that amount of supply on it, which is why they're not selling any MBS. They're just letting them bleed off over yeah. the rest of our lifetimes, I think, before they start buying again. 
So, Rudy, the Fed cut rates by 50 basis points a few weeks back, but bond yields have risen substantially since. What message is that sending? Is that the Fed is losing credibility? Uh, maybe. You know, I mean, they lost it with me years ago, but I'm I'm aberrant. So, yeah, I mean, it wasn't that surprising, I think. Some people predicted that, you know, it was going to happen, and sure enough, it, it has. Um, then again, who knows how manipulated any market is nowadays, you know, so. Um, That's a fair point. Yeah, I don't know. Are uh, you yeah. are you expecting that to continue to rise, or do you think that it's about reached where it's gonna where it's gonna sit? Well, they run into sort of an existential problem where the you know uh, the debt, um, the federal debt uh, uh, cost, the uh, interest, it, it just becomes unmanageable. I think it'd be probably borderline there. Um, so they'll they'll have to do something to try and bring it down. And um, but I don't know. I mean, if it I think the end game here, unless there's some sort of change in Congress, is the Fed, I think, is going to – I hate to see this because it's leading to the thing that I started this account to try and warn about. But the, the I, I hope not, but I think the Fed might end up just buying everything, just, you know, in the name of uh, – you know, we don't want the uh, the stock market to crash. Or actually, I'm, they're more worried, as uh, I think Mike Taylor says, they, the Fed has one job. It's basically to make the Treasury look solvent. So they're going to do whatever they can to keep the Treasury looking solvent. Yeah. So somebody I was speaking to recently, they had mentioned that they believe that the cycles are going to get shorter and shorter. You know, you have on the on the downside of rates, you have inflation pushing upward when the rates go too high you have debt servicing yeah. becoming an issue on the budget are you also of the opinion that these rate cycles are going to get shorter and shorter and shorter well i think a lot of people smarter than me have explained how we're ending this ever since 1980 this bond bull market this period of lower rates we also had an incredible um disinflationary uh, tailwinds that entire time such as globalization and other things that are going away and so the Fed is really going to have a problem with inflation because even as Powell says, people hate inflation. And even now they're growing everybody in the, the, the Fed and their shows in the media are, you know, hey, look, we're look at a progress. We're only at 3% or something. But 3% is, you know, I hate to do percentages or percentages, but it's 50% higher than the, the target of two, which they made up. You know, there's no, their, their, their mandate, of course, is stable prices. And if you look, they have a great chart. I can't believe they still publish it called um, Purchasing Power of the Consumer Dollar. You can find it on the Fred site. And it's just a, it's just a disaster show. And I and it basically just shows that even using their CPI numbers, which I, you know, I've posted many times on why I think that's a joke. Even using their official numbers, the uh, your purchasing power is just getting eroded away, you know, constantly for, yeah. you know, over for 100 years. So. Uh, it's, inflation's a problem, and I think it's going to be a problem, and I think that's going to handcuff them. So what they've been doing is they basically just change how they calculate inflation. I mean, uh, right. Charlie Bellello keeps posting and I keep retweeting his thing that, you know, hey, they said health insurance went down 34 percent, you know, over <laughs> last year or the year before. It's a joke. That's my single yeah. biggest expense. And it doesn't it did not go down at all. You know, so um, I think people see that. I think more and more people, it's, it's encouraging, realize that the data is, is BS. I mean, today we got the FBI crime numbers out, and it's like, oh, violent crime wasn't down. It was actually up. And But I, but they do monkey with the CPI. They always have. Uh, as Grant Williams says, uh, there's been constant revisions to the CPI. There's never been a revision that led to a higher CPI. So the purpose of the CPI is to hide their actual – they want inflation. Um, how many times you hear someone say, uh, usually it's a rich guy saying, hey, we need to inflate away uh, our debt. It's the only way out. Uh -huh. And I'm going back to my, my avatar there. Uh, no, you've made it, it, there's other ways out. But you just made a decision that you're going to it's you're going to choose the most regressive pathway out, the one that's best for rich people and financial markets. Um, you, you know, you've chosen to screw, you know, the vast majority of people. Um, uh, through inflation. It's the most regressive tax. And Bernanke says it's a tax. I got video out there of him telling Ron Paul that it's a tax and it's too high. He said this, I think it was around 2012. And when he said that, inflation was lower than it, CPI was lower than it is today. And uh, the other thing Bernanke, I have a video out there, is telling Ron Paul in 2010 that uh, Bernanke was telling Ron Paul that the uh, 
the balance sheet was going to get back under a trillion dollars uh, soon, you know, soon, eventually. So yeah. we're what we're still at seven trillion now, and we were at four trillion or so even before COVID. So you can't just say COVID was the excuse for everything. Yeah, and you know it's amazing regarding the CPI. Even if even if those numbers were one hundred percent dead on accurate, sure, they're excluding energy and food. Well, they're core. Yeah, um, they 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 do that. They, they, yeah, they, well, because you know we don't need that. The CPI is intended to uh, understate the actual rising cost of living. And I think most people realize that. And they have for years. Yeah. Uh, there was a 2015 John Hilson rep story in the Wall Street Journal where he was like, kind of like today, hey, everything's wonderful. What's wrong with you people? And I have a list out there. Again, this is all out there of uh, comments from the article. And this is in 2015 when official inflation was around 2%. And people are just going off on him. What are you talking about? My rent's going up. My 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 tuition's going up. My health care's going up. And and but John Hilson rep doesn't know that because all he's doing is talking to people like, you know, Ben Bernanke or Janet Yellen or Ron, uh, not Ron, uh, Jay Powell, you know, so. There's a lot of gaslighting. We have horrific financial yeah. media, uh, by and large. Yourself and other people like you. I mean, that, thank God we have this way to um, Truly. to talk. Because you're never. I mean, are you going to go on CNBC? I don't know. I mean, yeah. they shut down anybody that isn't uber bullish. Generally, um, I posted today a, an interview, and uh, Alex Perrine was on there years ago. If you can believe that, he's kind of a left wing guy, and he starts criticizing Jamie Dimon and and J P Morgan and Scott Wapner and Maria Bartiromo. So that's how old this was. This is on CNBC. They, they they are livid. They can't. Their heads are exploding. How dare you come on and criticize Jamie Dimon? You know it's it's unheard of. So, well, anyway. let's transition over to the consumer. U.S. auto loans, serious delinquencies of ninety plus days. They spiked to two point eight eight percent, the most since the second quarter of twenty ten. Yeah. They're rising at a similar pace to the time seen in the two thousand and eight financial crisis. Meanwhile. Auto loan debt, it hit a record $1.6 trillion. What is this telling us about the state of the consumer, and what can we expect from the consumer in the coming months? Well, I think there's a line in the big short, something to the effect of, um, you know, how do you make, uh, 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 you know, really stressed consumers feel better, and, you, you know, you give them cheap debt. And that's so we had a lot of years of cheap debt. A lot of people were buying, you know, $70,000 pickup trucks and stuff, and, um uh, even at 2.9% or, or whatever, it's, um, you know, it used to be a house. They went to eight-year loans, you know. Um, someone once gave me a good explanation of why poor people buy new cars um, is because they can't afford the uh, the repair costs of an old car. And they need a reliable car. And, of course, everybody buys on the payment. And when the payment was zero or 29 you know, that, that that's I, – I've gone to try and buy a car for cash years ago, and then the guy – Kept, I said, how much is the car? And, he, and of course, they kept saying, how much do you want to pay a month? I said, how much is the car? They wouldn't. Get, they didn't want to give me a, a number on the car. So the, it, it's um, it, cars cost what houses used to cost, you know. And you got eight year financing. Maybe you have more than that now. Um, it's no wonder that people are running into trouble. Of course, you need a car, you know, to go to work. So it's kind of a existential problem. Uh, basically, I assume people are paying. I mean, if you're defaulting on your car. You know, I don't know what that says about your work situation, you know, because if you don't have a way to get to work, you kind of it's even worse off. Um, I saw a stat and I don't know if it's accurate, but post pandemic, the average monthly uh, car loan is now over a thousand dollars. Yes. One third. One third right. of all car loans are now over over a thousand dollars. Right. Well, you know, everything, you know, low low rates hide um, high prices. And we had a long period of, of uh, low rates. And so most people think along the lines of monthly payment. I mean, my first uh, new car was about eight grand, and it was in, uh, gosh, in the 80s, I guess 80, around 85. I mean, and, and you know, just like houses, you know, the ratio of cars to incomes has skyrocketed, you know. Here's the funny thing, though. If you, uh, the CPI, and, I again, this is, this is one of the best examples of why the CPI is nonsense, is they do, uh, the BLS will give you a chart. You can go on FRED and see it, uh, the Federal Reserve St. Louis site, and, from about 1995 until around 2020, um, roughly, 25 years, uh, new car prices and used car prices didn't go up at all in the United States. If you look at the chart, just draw a line across. They went down, actually, for periods and then came back up. Now, this is, of course, absurd to anybody living in the real world, but to a math PhD, 
uh, what they're what they're telling us is, well, yeah, but the car went up ten grand, but you have fifteen thousand worth of you know new airbags and uh, better brakes and uh, better stereo. So the car actually, even though it went up ten grand, it actually went down five thousand dollars because we have we estimate that there's fifteen thousand dollars of hedonic quality adjustments in there. So that's how they come up with new cars and used cars not going up for twenty five years, and that that went in the CPI. And so that was a complete lie to, to people who live in the real world, you know, not to Larry Summers or, or you know, Paul Krugman or Justin Wolfers or these other clowns, but um, to the average guy, you know, or gang gal. It's, I think people are noticing it more, which is encouraging, because I kind of came on here in 2013 on, on the Twitter to try and just educate people, because I found many of my friends, especially after the financial crisis, you know, these are smart, you know, successful small businessmen and stuff, hardworking guys or or uh, so the guys I play poker with. You know, a lot of them are just, you know, really blue, uh, blue collar guys. And um, they had no idea about the, the, you know, the coup that I call it that took place in 08 under Hank Paulson, you know, and uh, Bernanke. And um, I was so it was kind of like to educate people. And I've been sending emails probably you know, for 10 years, you know, and then before I started the Twitter thing, and it's just kind of just to like, God, all these people are so smart and they follow, they own some of them, some of them own stocks and they have no idea what's going on. And uh, of course the, you know, the guys that are the, you know, uh, you know, hand to mouth uh, buddies that I have um, it's, it's of course way harder on them. And they, and they don't know what's, they, you know, they, they don't have time to watch CNBC or not that that, I mean, that causes brain damage anyway, but oh, wow. they don't have time to, to understand how they're being screwed by inflation among, and other things. They just know that they got to make a rent payment on the first, yeah. you know, so I try and help people with that. It's and I try and do, as you mentioned, I try and do humor because I don't want to just post, you know, look at how awful Ben Bernanke is. He is awful, but um, things like that. But I also want to put make people laugh and. One of my favorite things is when someone says, you know, oh, you made my day or I just spilled coffee all over my, you owe me a keyboard and things like that. So it, I like doing that, too. That's awesome. Well, Rudy, the number of people working multiple jobs in the U.S., it hit 8.66 million in September. That is a new record. It's mm-hmm. about 300,000 above the peak seen before the pandemic. And get this, about 600,000 above the 2008 peak. Yeah. Furthermore, the number of part-time jobs has jumped by about 3 million over the last three years to a record 28.2 million. At the same time, full-time employment has declined by 1 million since November of 2023. Multiple job holders have been rapidly rising over the last few years. Americans, they're fighting record high prices. Millions of Americans who are working multiple jobs basically just to afford the basic necessities. For millions of Americans, the solution to years of inflation is taking on another job. The reality is that even though the inflation rate is falling, prices are still rising, things are just not getting cheaper. How long can the consumer, the job holder, hang on like this before this situation literally breaks their back? It's it's tragic what's going on. You know, I mean, people literally are at wit's end. I mean, I read a lot of stuff um, and talk to people that are, uh, you know, there's a food bank near me and it's not a poor area. And uh, a lot of these people have families and homes and are not, you know, they're not living in their cars. And uh, there's like 900 families and individuals that go and pick up food every week there, you know, that's donated by the supermarkets and then the, the uh, volunteers put it all together. Um, that's in a good area. I, I mean, most people will call it a very, very nice area. So um, it just tells you about the quality of the jobs, I think, too. You know, um, uh, I was talking to an Uber driver the other day who was from Nicaragua, been here a few years, and uh, very impressed. You know, she, she, you know, you won't find anybody more pro-American than, than someone like her um, who comes to America. Her husband's Cuban, from Cuba. But anyway, um, they, another interesting employment status that the – Native-born Americans, um, the, the jobs have actually been declining, I think, for over a year or two, and, the, and all the new jobs are going to um, uh, immigrants, whether legal or I- illegal. Um, there's a clip that I posted, which I think just sums up Wall Street uh, totally uh, and, and big business, and it was uh, Mike Wilson, uh, who you, he's a fan, uh, I don't forget what Burmese with, but he's on like CNBC all the time, Mike Wilson, and he he's sitting there talking to Guy Adami, and he's sitting back, and he's very casually saying, yeah, you know, 
all these illegal immigrants we had coming in, they're they're willing to work for way below market wages. And he's like talking like, you know, this is a great thing. I ha- you know, I have any of these. I have a clip. If someone doesn't believe me, they can ask me. Um, and I think that's, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's, you know, letting all these immigrants in for, for voting. I think it's just big business of both parties want cheap labor, you know. So, um, it, yeah, I mean, there's a, the gig economy now is supposed to be 10 million people, you know, or something. I heard that the other day. Maybe that's drawing. Uh, I, have a, I have a buddy that was and his wife were driving Uber for a while um, just to make extra money. The, the thing is, I grew up when I grew up in the 60s and 70s. Um, I, I remember a, a middle class family that I lived in and we I saw firsthand the effects of inflation and how uh, uh, my dad had to. Uh, he started a business, an advertise a little like, uh, you know, neighborhood business, advertising business. And um, uh, he had to because. He had four kids and prices were out of control and his salary wasn't going up at all. He was a teacher. Um, at that point, they weren't, I don't think they were unions, so they weren't making much money even then. Um, and so he had to work two jobs, you know, uh, so it's not unheard of, you know, when, when, when you have periods of inflation and it hurts, it's a regressive tax. It hurts the poor and middle class the most. And the middle class, of course, doesn't have the, the, the help from the government generally that the very poor do or that the rich, very rich do, you know, so um, there's, they're on their own. And um, I think it's a lot, part of the angst in this country is a lot of people feel like they're on their own. The government does not have their back. And, uh, and, you know, every day it's something, oh, we're sending billions to this country and billions to that country. And people look around their neighborhood or around their city or their state and they go, oh, we sure could use some help here. So, Yeah, I think you hit the nail right on the head. Yeah. Rudy, in September, the S&P 500 saw the most downward earnings revision since December of 2022. In your analysis, what's the takeaway there? Well, one thing I've noticed um, a lot is um, – for example, I used to buy those uh, was it 1.75 liter bottles of uh, like Diet Coke, which is and they were 89 cents like all day long uh, on sale, and then they went up a bit, but now they're three bucks. So that's just in five years. I mean, you know. Um, so what I've noticed, <clears throat> excuse me, what I've noticed a lot of is I check. I've checked a few. I check Pepsi earnings and stuff. I've noticed the unit sales are down. The revenue is kind of flattish, maybe up a bit on higher prices. In other words, hey, I tell you, I buy a hell of a lot less Diet Coke than I used to, and and uh, uh, I'm not, I I can't be the only one because for me, inflation is an annoyance at this point in my life. For a lot of people, it's an existential decision: do I buy, you know, a six pack, a, a twelve pack of Diet Coke, or do I have money to pay the babysitter? You know, I mean, it's it's. It's, it's awful. And, of course, the people who smugly get on there, the Jonathan Chates and the Greg Ips and the Paul Krugmans, who who just kind of mock and sneer anyone who who says that inflation is a big deal to most Americans. They, it's 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 so insulting. And so I always punch up and I'm trying to defend like well, the middle class that is basically my main. Well, that's where I came from. And I'm trying to defend it. And there's nobody in the media really that ever defense. I just posted right before I came on here. I go on a lot of podcasts and uh, uh, not a lot. I've been on some, but I listen to a lot of podcasts. And um, well, when I'm walking or exercising or something, and uh, it's all it's generally like two or three really, you know, wealthy, uh, successful Wall Street guys. And or they have maybe there's an econ- a wealthy, successful economist on there, too. And they sit around and they talk about, you know, oh, the unemployment rate and the, this and that. And and the effect on the middle class and the poor, you know, that I, I said, the one thing you never see on any of these uh, podcasts and you never see it on CNBC, you don't see it on Bloomberg, is anybody remotely middle class or poor. You know, they don't they don't. Uh, they just don't make it in the in the in the discussion. I mean, there's actually a thing from Davos years ago. We have Larry Summers and Christine Lagarde and Ray Dalio sitting around. That's the panel, okay, talking about how to fix the middle how to fix the middle class. They they, they wouldn't know. It, it's for them, middle class is someone who's only worth nine figures or eight figures. You know, I mean, it's 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 ridiculous how out of touch uh, our government is. And there's a great quote that I retweeted today of a. Uh, guy reviewing a book and he says you know the, the the strangest thing about the weimar period was the disconnect between the the intellectuals and the general mood of the country and i think that's what we have in spades right now our pundits you know the, the uh, andrew ross sorkin you know he, he lives to be next to a billionaire so he, he has no he's hanging out with 
you know, Jamie Dimon and, and you know, who do you think uh, Powell's hanging out with on the weekend? You know, uh, David Rubenstein. I mean, you know, so he's not getting he has no clue. I don't think Powell does. I think, I, and Powell's not even an econ uh, uh, cultist. So yeah, he doesn't have that to, to excuse his uh, his ignorance. But, but Powell at least came out and he said, sorry to ramble on. Powell actually came out not that long ago and said people hate inflation. They hate it. And I'm screaming <laughs> quietly, dude, for like 15 years before 2022, every single member of the FOMC said, we inflation is too low. We want more inflation. Powell said inflate, low inflation was the greatest problem of our time. Janet Yellen's only regret at the Fed was low inflation. So then they come out and say, well, hey, people hate inflation. Well, then why the hell did you try and spike it? And they still want to spike it. They just have to be quiet about it. They got a monkey with the CPI. They can't say what they really want to do, which if you listen to the podcast, a lot of rich guys say, right? Oh, inflate away the debt. That's the fix for everything. I hear it every day. And, it, and it's, it's bad because it doesn't lead to good things. Yeah. Well, you're, you're hitting the nail right on the head. Let's, let's talk about something specific here in the market. Since October of 2023, the overwhelming majority of fund flows into equities has gone into technology. There's a chart that shows this, and there's just a spike in fund flows for technology and everything else is at that zero bound line. And it's all at the expense of everything, including industrials, telecom, materials, real estate, financials, energy, utilities. In fact, it's not even close it's really a one-dimensional um, fund flow, money flow going into tech. If and when the AI bubble bursts, are you wincing at the potential flight of money out of tech, and where do you see this wall of money going? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, uh, Mike Green's the best on the whole passive flow thing. Um, yeah, it's it's a remarkable to see, and um, like the SMH, you know, remember the chips got hit what yesterday or the day before, and uh, you know they were talking about you know oh the chips are getting slammed, the car oh it's just you know they were all you know if something's down one or two percent it's like 1987 on CNBC right, so I just I just usually do what I usually do I whip out a chart a long term chart and you know it's lower left to upper right straight to the moon and then there's a little tiny blip today when it's down one percent and I say oh my God look at the carnage in the chips. Uh, when I think the thing is, is it's a, a, a as Mike says, it's when you buy in, uh, like say an SPX or a tech ETF, there's no thinking involved. It's an automatic process. You gave me a hundred dollars. Um, Microsoft say is two is five percent of the index, so five dollars goes into Microsoft. Okay, so that's why it just feeds on itself. It's price um, insensitive investing. It has nothing to do with valuations. Those those are long long ago meaningless. Um, and uh, and someday that could work in reverse. And I think Mike particularly talks. Uh, Mike Green talks about. Um, you know, you could have air. You could have an air pocket down there between the bid and the ask. You know, um, if. Uh, on top of it, everybody's retiring. You know, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm 61. Uh, I, I always used to think my whole life of, oh, what, what am I, am I going to put money in the, in the 401k this year? You know, or the, my IRA now. Um, and this is not. I was thinking, you know, recently, like, wow, I'm not. I should really start thinking about taking money out. You know, and, uh, and I have, you know, to, to some degree. I haven't taken anything out of the retirement yet, though, but. I'm not the only one. I mean, there's people are, are turning, I don't know, 10,000 or turning 65 every day or something like that. And um, they're going to look at their, you know, they've done very well thanks to horrific monetary policy over the last, you know, um, 15 years or so. And uh, uh, they're going to start selling. And I think the, the things that spike prices on the upside, they could come into play on the downside. And then you have an air pocket. Now, Janet Yellen's already said we should buy, uh, the Fed should buy uh, stocks. Um, I got Michael Howell. I have a clip of him on a podcast talking about him, him being on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in 87. Remember the 87 crash? And one of the traders told him, oh, that was the, that was the uh, New York Fed on the phone. They were buying futures. And Howell's like, wait a minute. That's, that's, they're not supposed to do that. I think it's illegal. But when is being, something being illegal ever stop the Fed from doing anything? And the, and the sad thing is that if it was illegal and someone called the Fed on it, which no one will do, um, Congress would simply pass a bill the next day saying whatever the Fed wants to do is legal because Congress, you know, the Fed is Congress's drug dealer. So that's the way I look at it. And Cong that's Congress is ultimately the real problem. And as I point out on my when I when I comment that 
I pick on the Fed because most people have no idea how bad the Fed is and how its role in um, the kleptocracy, I call it. Um, but really, the Congress could put a leash on the Fed if they wanted to, and they don't want to. There's no Ron Paul in Congress today. I mean, Thomas Massey tries. Um, you know, I remember years ago when Ben Bernanke and, and uh, Bernie Sanders would be on the same side, you know, interviewing, uh, uh, you know, questioning someone on the Fed. And now there's nobody. They cheer it on. It's pathetic when when Powell goes before Congress or Yellen back in the day. They, 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 they're drooling over the Fed chairman because the Fed chairman enables them to be profligate and to um, – not have to think about anything. They can just, you know, hey, we need, we want to buy 15 battleships. Okay, no problem. We want to send 100 billion to Ukraine. No problem. We'll just, we got no problem. Well, someday so it's going to be a problem. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up the baby boomers, you know, retiring 10,000 a day. They still have an incredibly high allocation to the stock market in general. Highest ever. I Highest think. ever, right? Yeah. And the market's at its all time highs. They've not recalibrated their portfolios after the last few years of explosive growth. So, really, they have a lot of risk in their portfolios. And if they collectively experience a reverse wealth effect because of a stock market decline, that's even more pronounced for them due to their allocations. What do you think we could expect to see happen there in the economy if, if that were to take place? I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It's free. Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer, economy, markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and all the expert interviews that we conduct just like this one. They're all up there. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote. It's based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled, If You Don't Own Gold, You Know Neither History nor economics. The free gift is a must-read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe, and receive the free gift on us. Also, I'm positive that you've enjoyed the conversation with Rudy as much as I have. Please let him know by hitting the like and subscribe button and leaving a comment below the video.